Yes. Basta parlare la lingua di Mordor. Buonasera a tutti, eh, benvenuti, sono felice di vedere che siete in molti ed è con immenso piacere che questa sera ospitiamo la professoressa Salima Ikram eh, in questo ciclo di conferenze che si tengono per l'ACME. Eh, ritengo che la dottoressa Ikram non abbia bisogno di, di grandi presentazioni, eh, è la massima esperta in materia per quanto concerne la mummificazione animale, ma non solo, ha lavorato ovviamente in moltissime spedizioni archeologiche, attualmente è eh, contitolare dell'Animal Mummy Project eh, in, al Cairo e insegna anche all'American University in Cairo. Ehm, la sua, questa sua scelta di dedicarsi alle, alle mummie animali è dettata anche dall'amore che nutre eh, per gli animali in generale e eh, vedremo nella conferenza che ci terrà proprio le, sva, la, la, le sfaccettature che eh, l'animale aveva nella società egizia, quindi non solo quella eh, connessa eh, alla, alla religione, ma anche quella diciamo, eh, che, che voleva essere di accompagnamento, il, quello che chiamiamo il pet, quindi l'animale da compagnia, piuttosto che anche l'animale diciamo, da lavoro. Ehm, eh, la dottoressa, no, non ho anche detto che la professoressa lavora collabora con una importante rivista americana di, di egittologia che è la KMT, la KMT, da molti molti anni, e, per cui diciamo che non potevamo avere veramente una, una migliore relatrice questa sera su questo argomento, eh, vi ri, ripeto è la massima esponente in materia quindi siamo felicissimi ed estremamente onorati di accoglierla eh, al Museo Egizio di Torino. Eh, avrei adesso piacere che la presentasse in modo più, più degno e più consono il, anche il direttore del Museo Egizio di Torino, il dottor Cristian Greco, che ci onora della sua presenza. Prego. So I switch to English to welcome our guest. Uh, well, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Ikram here. She's uh, uh, well, a guesting house. She's been here regularly in the last few weeks, and we are very happy that you will be seeing her very often in the coming future. Uh, I just want to say a couple of words because I don't want to waste your time, and um, she has wonderful projects to talk about. But I'm very proud to say that um, we have settled at cooperation between our institution. We're just about to sign a memorandum of understanding between the Museo Egizio and the American University in Cairo, which sees uh, Professor Ikram as the main uh, player in this uh, cooperation. She is taking part, actively taking part, in the study of our um, animal mummies. She will be in charge on writing the catalog on our animal mummies, and we're very honored that uh, the most important expert in the world is studying our own mummies. And she's also pretty much involved in the um, 
human mummies and uh, um, both in the analysis and micro invasive analysis and she's also involved in this canopic uh, analysis doing with Professor Rulli. Um, well, uh, I hope that in the near future our cooperation will be consolidated in exchanging uh, students, in exchanging uh, professionalities that could go to Cairo and come here, uh, having at the center the material culture to whom we are both very devoted to. And uh, uh, I think that together we can reach important results both for our uh, community here and for Egyptian that could have the chance to come here and study our collection. So thank you so much for being here and thank you so much for accepting to study with us our wonderful collection. Thank you very much, both of you, for your very kind introductions. It is a great honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, and I thank the Friends of the Egyptian Museum for their collaboration and generosity. Um, can we have the lights? Thank you. Um, as has been said, I am very fortunate to be able to work on the animal mummies here in collaboration with some very fine people who are in this audience already. Um, today, I'm going to talk about animal mummies in general, but with a focus on the Turin collection, with some of the images from things that you will be able to see currently on display, and maybe, inshallah, in the near future. So, as we all know, the ancient Egyptians mummified humans, and, as those of us who live in Turin know, they also mummified animals because animals were a very important part of the lives of the ancient Egyptians. But before we go further, I would like to define what I mean by the word mummy. A mummy is an artificially preserved human or animal, and the ancient word, of course, for these humans in particular, was sah. However, the modern word mummy comes from Persian and Arabic, Mom or mumia, which is this black stuff that you see over here, which is often on both humans as well as on animals. Now, for the ancient Egyptians, as indeed for us until relatively recently, animals were extraordinarily important. They, of course, gave us food and continue to do so unless we're vegetarian. Um, they also provide us with clothing shelter, um, and for the ancient Egyptians had a very important role in religion, um, and they themselves had souls, like human beings. They of course provided us with companionship and protection, so pets of use as well as affection were part of the landscape of the ancient Egyptians. Now we have many different types of animal mummies. When you look at them, you might think that all animal mummies are the same, but that's not so. Because we have the first kind, our pets. Many of you have pets. You wish to take them with you when you die. You would like to be reunited in the afterlife. And that was the same for the ancient Egyptians. Food is a uniquely ancient Egyptian um, kind of mummy. And the idea was that you could take food with you so that you wouldn't starve in your afterlife. The Museo Egizio is one of the few museums in the world outside of Egypt that has a fabulous collection of food mummies, um, especially from the Valley of the Queens and Imhotep's tomb. So we will be looking at those shortly. Tutankhamun, who was a growing boy, had over 45. Um, food mummies in his tomb so that he could snack whenever he was hungry. Um, the most common for the Romans form of animal mummies were the sacred animal. The idea was, bless you, um, for them that the spirit of the gods could enter into a totemic animal. During the lifetime of the animal, the god would be praised, he would be revered, he would have oracular powers. When this animal died, the spirit of the god would enter the body of another animal 
Just like the Dalai Lama spirit moves from body to body to body. Um, when the animal died, it would be mummified and buried with great pomp. The most common form of animal mummy that we have are the ex votos. When you go to a church, you light a candle, right? The spirit, your prayer, is taken up to God by the smoke. The Egyptians did not like short-term things. They liked long-term solutions. So they would, in fact, dedicate an animal mummy to take the prayer to a particular god because they felt that if it is a sacrifice of a living being, it is a much bigger sacrifice. And also, the living being in the afterlife will be able to go to the god of its choice and say, hey, here, Guido has sent me. Please, please pay attention. So we have this whole idea. And of course, there are some animal mummies that don't fit into any of the categories we have made up. And so those fall under the idea of other and are always open, we are always open for discussion for these things. Now, why do we study animal mummies? Because certainly in some of the earliest periods of Egyptological history, people paid no attention. They would buy them as curiosities. They would send them home and say, ugh, strange, or maybe beautiful. But for a long time, people had no interest in animal mummies. They, in fact, during the 19th century, many thousands of cat mummies were taken and used as ballast for ships. They were brought to Liverpool um, or other docks like, like Marseille. They were brought there and then people said, what do we do with them? So either they would throw them So how do we study animal mummies? Very much in the same way that we look at humans. You look at the mummies themselves, visually, which is the least destructive thing you can do. Then we also do radiographs and CT scans whenever possible. 
One can test embalming materials and to find out how mummies are made and what kind, how you can identify places archaeologically where they are made, we use experimental work. So here are some examples of um, mummies being examined. The one on the right shows the Cairo Museum mummy project where we were looking at mummies. And the one on the left over here shows you uh, mummies being examined in the field at the site of Abu Rawash. Another source of information, of course, is places where we know that embalming took place. So here we have uh, Memphis, where we think the Apis bulls were embalmed. Uh, ah. Oops. Ha ha. <laughs> this is where the Apis bulls were embalmed. And also in Tunal Gebel, where either embalming took place or where there was um, consecration of these things when they were ex -votors. And of course, experimental archaeology is a very good thing to do. Because basically, a mummy is a desiccated creature. So what one does is, there's a variety of ways of doing it, but one of the important things is to eviscerate. And with most animals, you don't need to do anything with the brain because it's so small, so you leave it in. So when you shake animal mummies, the brain rattles because the brain's shrunk down, and it's like a little ball inside the head. Um, so once you have eviscerated, you desiccate and defat using natron, which is a naturally occurring substance that comes from the Wadi Natrun in Egypt. And after it has been dried, it is oiled and resins are applied and it is wrapped up and then finito. So here we have an example of one of the first mummies we made. Um, this is called Mopsy, if any of you have ever read Beatrix Potter, named after those rabbits. Um, that one was eviscerated in a very dramatic way. Then this is um, Thumper, no sorry, Peter, and he was eviscerated from the side and we put little bags of natron in um, and then you can see we are pouring resin and mixed with oil on him to make him all beautified. These were then wrapped. And uh, please do not be upset if you are vegetarian. I know that people eat rabbits a lot in this part of Italy, alhamdulillah. But these are all from the butcher. So they would have been dying anyway. But now, like any ancient Egyptian mummy, they live forever. Um, so we wrap them with the texts from the Book of the Dead or other funerary books. Uh, this was a sheep we did. And you can see they are very nice and happy. The first one, I was not sure how much oil to use on it after it had been dyed because I thought, oh, you put too much oil, you are rehydrating. So what are we going to do? So it dried in a funny way, so it looks like it's dancing. But it's a happy rabbit. The other one I was more confident with, and you see that a lot of the, the animal mummies we have, in fact, have had a lot of oil on them, which is why some of the, the flesh and the, the fur has started to disintegrate. And that one has had much more oil on it, and probably when we look at it 10 years from now, we will find that it is not as beautiful as the dancing bunny. You can come and visit these if you ever wish to. They are in my office. You can see that frequently people come. They bring offerings of carrots, chocolates, and gin. Um, now, it has also been thought that some animal mummies, particularly birds, are made by taking a bird after it is dead and dipping it without drying it straight into a mixture of oil and resin and then wrapping it up. And we have this because we have examples of what look, clearly these are ibises that have been dipped. Um, but unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, I have not been able to do this experiment yet. Now here, I'm also, throughout this talk, I'm going to be showing you mummies from all over, but my focus is going to be this museum's mummies. And as um, Dr. Greco has already said, um, it is what, the thing that we are focusing on because there's a cooperation going, and uh, here he is himself. <laughs> But um, here we go. So I want to thank the various people here who have been helping. 
Um, and also, of course, Mathilde and Cynthia, who are working on the textiles. Um, but you can see that it has been, so far we have been recording several of the animal mummies. We haven't recorded all of them, but visually I think we have. We just need to now start with the um, radiographic documentation. Um, you can see that we have been not only in the exhibition space, but also in the storerooms. And now I will proceed with giving you examples of each type of mummy and showing you some special things about it, as well as things that we can learn from these remarkable artifacts from ancient Egypt. Now, we all know that cats were pets, and in fact, it is because of animal mummies we now know that cats were most probably domesticated in Egypt. There was a debate as to whether they were domesticated in Cyprus first or Egypt, but work um, using animal mummy DNA samples together with cat, live cat samples from all over the world, we have been able to establish the fact that it is quite probable that Egyptian cats antedate the, Syri uh, the Cyprus cats. So already we have learned something that only animal mummies can tell us. Um, of course, you see them in paintings, but we also have this marvelous sarcophagus, which is in the Cairo Museum, retrieved from Memphis, which shows you a animal mummy, cat, that is a cat, in its cat form, but also, like you see in tombs, as a, a mummiform cat, receiving its offerings. The Egyptians were enormously fond of their pets, and we even have examples of dogs that had been mummified because they died, probably their owner died, the dog was very sad, the dog died, and so the dog was mummified, here he is. This is Happy Men, he's in the University of Pennsylvania now, but he comes from Abydos, and the dog was at his feet in the coffin. It is just the same way that when you see the medieval knights, having their dogs at their feet for eternity. So you can see thousands of years have passed, but human beings remain the same. This is a very nice one here. Um, here we have, it's a picture on a coffin. Unfortunately, the contents weren't there, but because of the picture, I suspect that here again, we had the dog buried with its owner. And here the dog's name is here, and the owner's name is here, and um, I don't know if you have these in Italy, they're back scratches. No, yes. Anyway, they were invented in ancient Egypt. Um, this is a very curious story. Now, this lady, Mat Kare, lived in the 21st dynasty, um, about 1000 BC, 900 BC, roughly. Um, she was found in the royal burial cache that was in Deir al-Bahri. And when they found her, they found that there was a small bundle with her. The people who found her said, it's a baby. This is shocking. She was a priestess. She was a high priestess. She should have been a virgin. Maybe they had her killed with her baby. Or maybe she died in childbirth. But anyway, this is shocking. I have to tell you, they were all men. Um, Anyway, in the 1960s, there was a project to x-ray the royal mummies. She was amongst them. The last day, in July, they said, we've finished with everything. We've got one film left. Should we just leave it or should we do something? Nasri Skandar said, wait, there's the baby. So they said, okay, let's do the baby. This is not a baby, it's a green monkey. So all these years, almost a hundred years, this poor woman had a very bad reputation because some people had not very nice minds. So now we know though that Mark Carre loved her monkey so much that it was buried with her and she took her pet with her forever. We also have these um, monkey and dog belonging perhaps to Amenhotep II or Horemheb. And in Saqqara, at the tomb of Tia and Tia, they were in fact amazingly blessed because they had dog pets, cat pets, and about nine different monkeys, and one of whom 
had this beautiful coffin in the shape of a monkey. The same way as you have an anthropoid coffin, you have a monkeyoid coffin here. Um, there are other monkeys that have been retrieved from the uh, Valley of the Kings. And what is notable is that almost all of these have their canines, the baboons, have their canines missing. Now these canines seem to have been taken out probably for the most part after death, but some of them have them taken out earlier because they've grown over. Um, but baboons are very large and fierce creatures and if they bite you, it's very painful, even if they mean to be loving. So it is possible that there was some sort of veterinary activity and these m teeth were removed. For the ones where you don't have it grown over, it is possible also that the teeth were removed and used in magical practices. And you also have amulets often with the teeth of these animals. Here, this is one, you have two fabulous baboons here in Turin. Um, and you can see over here also, the canine tooth is missing. And it is, I haven't had much of a chance to study it, but it is quite possible that it was removed when the animal was young, the place that grew, the gum grew over, and so you have someone who is a nice baboon who can be your pet, and even if he is feeling bad-tempered, he can't injure you or your children. Um, here we have a gazelle mummy, which is from um, Cairo. And now we move on to food mummies, which you can see here. As you know, the Egyptians believed you could take everything with you. And of course, they were often very hungry in the afterlife because you want to live well um, and eat well. So you have a lot of these food mummies. Um, this is in Cairo, where we have, you can see this very nice coffinet which is black on the outside and the inside, and contains, as you can see from the x-ray, um, ribs. So, um, sort of costello, yeah? In a barbecued state. And here we have um, some, oopsie, um, ducks. Now this one, was belonged to the grandparents of Tutankhamun, and we were allowed to do some testing in Cairo, um, which was of this black residue, because everyone always say it's bitumen, but it wasn't. It turned out to be terebinth resin, and this is resin that comes from Lebanon. It is imported, and even in some of the old Middle Eastern recipes, it is used to give flavor to food. It gives a very nice scent. So it's possible that this was in fact prepared to be eaten. And here in Turin, we have Imhotep, where we have a very fine um, pigeon that has been mummified and been given as an offering. Pigeon is still very popular in modern Egypt. Now, the um, next type of animal mummy I will talk about are these amazing sacred animals. Um, the, these kind of necropolis existed from Dynasty One. We know that there was a sacred April apis bull, but they really became popular about 600 BC. And you start seeing huge animal cemeteries established all the way from, in fact, Alexandria, which does not appear in this map, to Aswan. which is where you have underground catacombs, which is where the sacred bulls were kept. Um, these bulls were sacred to the god Ptah and were oracular and extremely powerful and related to the strength of the king. We have thousands of stele dedicated to the apis, and unfortunately, although now we don't have any apis bulls, we have two bulls that might have come from nearby catacombs, an extension of the Apis Catacomb, in the Smithsonian Museum in, um, in uh, Washington, D.C. And in fact, those are probably the only two currently extant large-scale bull mummies in the form of bulls, um, which you can see here. 
and we are currently carrying out carbon-14 dating on the collection of this, these bulls as well as a few other objects, which will be very interesting to compare with what we have here in Turin because some of the objects are very similar and so we will be able to have checks and balances and really start to establish a proper chronology of when each kind of mummy came into being, when it was popular and what the socio-economic and political background in Egypt might have been at any particular time to make all of this happen and make these kinds of cults popular in their way. Um, this bull was quite complicated to x-ray, but you can see we managed to do it, and it is not one bull. It is a mixture of several bulls that have been put together. Um, so we've got one adult. We have one that is under two years old. We have bones of a third that is probably yeah, two years and a bit. So, and we're still trying to analyze this. So you, the whole idea of how these are made is something that we are still having to understand. So there's no, no certain knowledge about anything um, until we do more studies. Um, burial places for bulls, aside from the Serapium in Saqqara, is the Bukeum in Armant. And this gives you an example of what these things would be like. Central passageways with slots which contain massive sarcophagi, which contain bulls, um, or even their mothers. So this is a reconstruction based on the debris that was found of what they would have looked like when they had been buried in these slots. They're very impressive. Now, when they were finding this, when the excavators were finding it, they found that many of them wore bead nets, but also they found a number of these objects that looked like oil cans. No one knew what they were, and the excavators took them back to England and had a display and one of them had a friend who was a veterinary surgeon who was very interested in all these cows. So he came to visit the exhibition and he said, I know what they are, they're nothing to do with oil. They're enemas. You use them for large animals when they have problems in their bowels. And this means probably that these were used, as Herodotus has said, to give a special kind of mummification made with oil of turpentine that is introduced into the body that melts all the internal organs instead of removing them uh, physically, and then you can drain them out. Most scholars have poo-pooed Herodotus' ideas, but we have found that they probably are examples. We have Middle Kingdom um, examples. I have seen a uh, Greco-Roman or Greek, I think a Ptolemaic example, and so we decided to experiment with another rabbit. And in fact, this was the most tidy and easy way and least smelly to start with, at any rate, um, way of actually doing a mummification. So, um, another big thing that we have are crocodiles. Now, we have massive crocodiles here in Cairo, and we have some very large crocodiles here in Turin as well. When I was cleaning one of our crocodiles, which is more than five meters 40, I found inside its mouth baby crocodiles. And that is because the Egyptians looked at nature, and even in nature, the mother crocodiles often protect the babies by keeping them in their mouths and taking them into the water by their mouths, letting them swim, and then when they want to go back to land, put them back in their mouth. For the Egyptians, it's also a sort of a symbol of resurrection and birth by creating through the mouth, through saliva. And so this was a very potent image for them. 
And so we wound up with crocodiles mummified in the mouth. Here we have one of our Turin crocodiles, which are enormous, and I do hope they all go on display because they're fabulous. Baboons were also sacred, and we have some examples, um, such as you saw earlier. And also we have rams for Khnum in Aswan. Um, and this one you can see it's quite sweet. Um, it's probably a Roman one, and it's got a little tail that looks like no ram's tail that you will see in nature. But what is interesting is that when you x-ray them, you can see that these animals were very, very old. Their teeth are completely worn down. So the gods were being fed by hand with mushed up food so they would live much longer. And in fact, we are using the length of, of the lifetime possible for these rams to calculate the reigns of kings. So we do this with Apis, but we can do it with the rams as well from Elephantine. And you can see that they are not only providing us information about animal cults, but about how long a king might reign and giving us more secure dating for Egyptian history. Um, we have different kinds of cows like this, as you see here, and also this wonderful one that you have from Turin. There are three of these in this collection, which are quite fabulous. And by looking at it, it's not a full-grown animal. In fact, it's quite young. It's probably under 18 months or so. And this is what the whole thing looks like. You can see that the head has been put into a separate wrapping, and the bones have all been piled together here and wrapped up quite beautifully to make them look as if they were all one animal. Now, moving swiftly to um, votive offerings, this is the largest number of animal mummies we have, and all kinds of species can be seen here. We have different kinds of birds, we have goats, we have dogs, cats, um, lizards, fish, these are both here in Turin, um, and some wonderful um, really, this is one of the nicest uh, sort of receptacles, coffins, I have seen for an animal mummy. And this is here in Turin, and it is probably for a shrew. Because shrews are associated with the sun god. The sun god at night can only see through the eyes of the shrew, which is a nocturnal animal. And so you often see shrews found together with different kinds of hawks and falcons, which are the sun god during the daytime. Um, we have a huge number of very beautifully presented um, raptor mummies, hawks or falcons or what have you. We still have to image them to see because then we can try and understand which animals they were and sometimes what time of year they might have died because some birds only pass through Egypt, they're not resident. And therefore by looking at these and identifying them to species, we can have a better understanding of time of year as well as working together to get a better understanding of which animals are associated with what gods and why. Because each species has a very distinct um, ecosystem, habitat, and behavior pattern. We also have them in all kinds of receptacles, as you can see, in addition to wood and cartonnage. There are a lot of metal ones, and there's a lot of work to be done on these metal receptacles. Some of these are empty, some of these are full. This one still contains a snake. And what is interesting is that many of these smaller ones tend to have hooks on them attached to them so that they could be suspended. It is perhaps a fantasy, but I think that in the temples they must have had places where they would have been able to suspend these and maybe they would hit against one another making chiming noises invoking the god and had therefore had a part, an active part to pay, play in the rituals invoking the different deities. Um, they are found in a variety of places, these votive mummies. Sometimes they are piled willy-nilly, like you see here. Sometimes they are better placed. And a lot of the mummies I'm going to show you belong to ibises. Um, this is at Saqqara, where you have ibis and falcon galleries, which you can see are filled with these pots that have allegedly one bird in each pot. Um, these were given 
and kept in the temple as offerings once a year or twice a year. There was a big festival. People came from all over Egypt and they came and in that procession these offerings would then be put into these catacombs and piled high in there quite neatly as you see. And we have several examples of these here in Turin. And some of these have never been opened. So it would be very nice if we can see exactly what's inside them. Um, this is the site of Tunal Gebel, which is another place where we have many more ibis mummies. And this just gives you a sense of the scale of these kinds of subterranean chambers. Um, you go down them, and this, this is not mud. Even today when you go down, these are actually layers of sacred oils that have been poured as offerings. And when you sit down at the stairs, you can see each layer like a leaf. And so you can see the many times people have come and given libations to the gods. It's amazing to still be able, after 2,500 years, to actually be in contact with that last act of prayer that was carried out. This place is filled again with these pots, which contained primarily ibises, but also baboons. And many of the ones we have in Turin come from here, as well as from other sites throughout Egypt. Now this might look like a rather boring package, but inside you have this beautiful ibis with its wonderful beak stretched out. And you can see that in fact, it had been twisted and put down like this. And some of the ones we have, the head is underneath the wing as if it were asleep. So it's very beautifully thought out and organized. In another ibis I've looked at, not in Turin, um, we had food being placed inside the beak of the ibis so it wouldn't be hungry in the afterlife. And I'm hoping that if we x-ray them here, we will find others like that. Um, you can see these ones are also from Turin. These are from Asyut. And although they're from the same necropolis, they seem to be very differently bandaged, which I would be interested to find out if we can work out in terms of chronology, because they all come from the same place. Or maybe this talks to us about atelier. Different ateliers are giving you fabricating these mummies. Um, in some places, we have eggs that are being given as offerings, sometimes wrapped up or sometimes in baskets. This is one of the most sexy bird mummies I've ever seen. Here's in Turin, and you can see he's got a lovely collar around his neck. Whether that is something that was original or enhancement, he's still very delightful, and I think this is a young kestrel, um, which we have quite commonly, um, and is one of the most favored kinds of raptor mummies ever given, and because of their number, I think that they probably were being specially bred, like the ibises. So this would be the first example of birds of prey that are actually being domesticated and trained and tamed to some extent in the history of the world. At the site of Abydos, we have many, many kinds of animal mummies in primarily uh, ibises and dogs at the site of the Teti Sherid um, pyramid. It's been reused in the Roman or late Ptolemaic time. We have these dog mummies. There are only a few thousand, but you can see that they range from newborns to mature animals. Some of them suffered some injuries. In some cases, no one did anything, but in others, you can see that their legs have been splinted together, and so there was a vet who was looking after them, so they were probably being bred and looked after. Here, again, at Baidos, in the Shunat al-Zabib, you can see all these pots emerging. Most of these contained ibises, but some of them contained large, furry creatures, which are dogs with very, very long hair, and these I would love to do some DNA testing on to see what kind of dogs we're getting, whether if we can see how they have evolved within different groups and compare them to modern Egyptian dogs, um, because the fur on this one is quite extraordinary. 
Um, otherwise, we also have, in addition to sort of the longer, hairier dogs, we have tiny little things that are more like dark sounds. And um, here's another example of this. Now, it is somewhat possible, this was a bit of a young dog, because not all of the bones are fused. Um, you can see that it's a puppy, in fact, um, because the epiphyses are not fused here and here. Um, so it's probably about yeah, 10 months old. Um, now, what's interesting is that the neck is particularly jumbled. Now, this could be because this mummy has had been moved around a lot. But we do know from other kinds of mummies, and in fact dogs as well, that sometimes the Egyptians, because remember, this is a sacrifice, they would actively kill the animal by breaking the neck or hitting it over the head. And so this might be an example of such an act. Um, here is a cat that we have from Turin, and this one again is relatively young, so we are getting a vast age range. Um, and I'm beginning to think that we might have a variation in some of the species of the cats that we're seeing here, because I think we might have one or two wild cats as well, swamp cats, in addition to the normal um, Felix catus. This one, I'm pretty sure, has had its neck broken deliberately because the rest of the thing is in very good shape. So I think that this mature animal had been killed so that it could become a divine offering. This one is a teeny weeny kitten, probably a very few weeks old, well, maybe a month at that. Um, and it had been given a lot of resin so that it looks like this. Here we have a slightly larger animal, which has got a fabulous coffin, this nice dog. Um, this cat is extraordinary because when you pull it out, you can see that there's a cat mummy right inside. This museum has one of the widest outside of Cairo. It's the only one that has such a huge range of species as well as containers. So it's really quite fabulous. This one in Cairo I wanted to show you because he's wearing a mask, just like a human would. Um, we even have gazelles, such as this one. And this is quite interesting because a very thin gazelle, to make it a bit bulky, has been wrapped up in papyrus, then in linen, and you can barely see it. But he has eyes painted on and ears that were modeled in this linen. Um, Toparaños, or shrews, are common. Um, as I said, many of them are in gold. And we have snake mummies as well, also associated with the sun god. Um, this one is here in Turin. And unfortunately, the snake has disintegrated a bit, but it's very nice to see that the box actually contains what it's supposed to. Um, the head is over here. This one is on display. And what is nice about the work we're doing is that sometimes in earlier moments, people had put labels down because it looked like whatever they thought it looked like. But by be doing an x-ray, we have now found out that this is in fact actually a shrew, not a mongoose or an ichneumon, and again sacred to the sun god. And it is one of the largest shrews that we have in Egypt, so it's very important. And you can see there's a little bit of resin in its mouth which has been put there to make sure that the shrew does not get overactive and bite anyone in the afterlife. Um, we have more snakes. And sometimes when you see a package like this, it's often labeled as being shrews. But this one really does contain a snake. And it, too, has been rendered neutered by having this in its mouth. This is from elsewhere, but you can see that the package looks just like that package, but it contains about 14 shrews. Um, this is in Cairo. And many times we think, ah, the Egyptians took such care. It's such a beautiful, beautiful crocodile, the tail up, the head here. And actually, the x-ray shows that it's reversed. The head is here, the tail is there, and there's an extra head. So two for the price of one. Um, other things, beautifully marked with a lovely ibis in applique, contain only feathers and mud. And sometimes we have these false mummies. And I think they're not necessarily false, 
I mean, they are false, but the ancient Egyptians made them because sometimes things fall off, feather, fur, fins. Now, when you are being mummified, you are going from being secular to sacred. You become something that is holy. While the man this transformation is taking place, anything that falls off has to be secured and kept in a holy way. And so maybe they were taking all of these fallouts and turning them into mummies, or else maybe a part symbolized a whole. Or maybe the temples were cheating people, because it's not the first time that religious people have done that. Um, this one, where you see, actually contains some eggs. So it looks like an ibis bundle, but it contains ibis eggs. This one is here in Turin. It was marked as a baboon mummy. Actually, I think it was marked as a dog mummy. It looks like a baboon, but it contains a human being's femur in it. So in fact, it is almost, I want to x-ray it desperately, because I think it's made up of bits and pieces. I think it is probably ancient, but it is a false mummy. And this one is in Cairo. You see it's got a very nice head. And the reason it has such a nice head is because it really has no head at all. That might be, in fact, put somewhere else in some other mummy so a part can signify the whole. No matter, though, there is still, we can, as you can see, there is a huge amount that we can learn from animal mummies. And being able to test them, to do carbon-14 dating, to look at their DNA, to look at isotopes, to see where they might have been bred or where they would have been come from, like the baboons, are all really important ways of learning more about ancient Egyptian culture and civilization. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor Ikran, for your very interesting uh, lecture. Um, qualcuno vuole avere delle domande da fare alla professoressa Ikran? Tutto chiaro? <laughs> ok, uh, forse, ok, arrivo. Okay, so first of all, thank you for this uh, uh, wonderful overview and journey into the, the, this very, very complex uh, field. Um, I actually, I, if I may, I have, t I have two questions. <laughs> one is about, the, uh, one is about um, what you, just the last slides you showed, all these mummies, that, these false mummies, so I'm, I'm wondering, what is the scenario, uh, scenario here? Uh, we know that sometimes embalmers wrought havoc with uh, the insides of human mummies as, uh, as well. Um, is this, is, do, you, do you think the, it's the embalmers, you know, in the secrecy of their uh, uh, wor workshop, of their taboo uh, doings, uh, sometimes, you know, kind of, kind of cut corners and we have these tables laden with anim animals and they just put together whatever happens to be at hand just to s and, and the customer can't see what's inside it anyway. It's going to be that kind of, is that, is that the scenario you think we, we may be looking at or do we simply need further investigation before uh, we, we can shed light on this particular uh, aspect? And that's one, and that the other one, okay. Okay, that's right. Can you hear this? Oh, goody. Um, so, these false mummies, which I've started now to call amalgam mummies, and at this conference in Lyon, I'm going to propose this as a change, because when you see, say, call them fakes, people think of them as modern fakes. They're really difficult, and I think that maybe expecting all of them to come under one rubric is a mistake. Because, for example, at Abu Rawash, we found huge numbers of them, well, you know, out of the ones we actually examined, um, that were really bouquets of feathers. 
that had been nicely tied up and wrapped. Now, having done mummification myself, I have found that feathers and bits of fur fall off. And perhaps, so one thing is that it is sacred, so you wrap it up. And if you want to, A, because you have to, and B, you don't make a loss by wrapping, by, so you wrap it up even more nicely and you do sell it. And then we hope that if you say it is what it is, it becomes what it's supposed to be. And those are two options. And then, of course, there's a third one, which is the embalmers were lying. And they were lying because they were lazy. Or they were lying because they ran out of stuff to mummify. Sometimes does happen. I'm just question. You mentioned a lot of time, oil, oil, oil. What kind of oil was? That is an excellent question. <laughs> I love it. Um, the ancient Egyptians, from what we know from texts, would have used um, lettuce oil, perhaps, mm -hmm. castor oil, less likely, later on, almond oil, possibly even olive oil. Mm -hmm. So there are many oils they could have used. Some of them appear. Um, Lettuce oil, for example. There are very few texts that tell you, oh, give you embalmer's good. bills. There are only the receipts that you have. <laughs> so in the fattura, you have one or two oils, but otherwise moringa oil oh. is one that is mentioned. Um, unfortunately, when we've done analyses, you can only get to the point at, at this moment in, in chemistry of saying vegetable oil yeah. or whether it's a fat, but you can't distinguish which exactly one? Defined because by one. now they've disintegrated uh, too much. Because when you, in Italy, when we say oil, people think as olive oil. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Thank you very much. I think there's a question back there. Simon. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Seleva. I have also two questions. I was wondering if you can differentiate a mummy of a pet and a mummy of um, an animal as an ex voto. Um, if you have a cat, can you say if it's an ex voto or a pet? I, I think the, all the basic what we do is, is contextual. Uh -huh. And that's one of the problems with having museum collections sometimes. If there's no provenance, you're sort of stuffed. Um, however, with the ex votos on the whole, they're far easier to tell because they are much of a muchness and we've still got some in situ so you can compare them. So I think that those are easier to identify. I think that pets out of context are much harder to identify. You have to find them in the tomb with the deceased or in the courtyard or something. And they have to be sort of one or two, not hundreds of them. So I think it is really contextual and it is very, very difficult as a result. And sometimes, how do you tell a sacred animal in a catacomb from an ex votos? So we have been trying to work on this because of course now that people are working freshly on excavated material. We're trying to see if you can indeed tell the difference or maybe we are mistaken about this whole idea. But for example, in the Anubis catacombs in Saqqara, we have niches. And I'm wondering if the niches might contain the sacred animal and all the other ones are the ex votos. And just now, I was working last two weeks ago in Abydos. And there was something that I looked at. It was a wooden coffin, which contained a ibis mummy, which was wrapped in a red shroud. And it was the first red shroud I have ever seen on an animal mummy, though we know them from humans. Now, this turned out, because I was very excited, I said, first of all, it's red, then it's in a box. And then I looked at where it was excavated, and there was a niche cut into the Shunat al-Zabib, which suggested to me that perhaps this was a sacred one, or maybe it was just someone paid a lot of money for it. I don't know. And that's a real problem which we are still struggling with. Because like the Horus, the hawk that you have here when you go in, um, in the first room, by its box, by its coffin, it should really be the sacred raptor. But I don't know. Because again, where was it found and how do we differentiate between the two? With the apis bulls, if we had found more inside them, at least you've got the text on their 
uh, sarcophagi. So this is something that we are still really struggling with, and I think the people who are now working on excavations are trying to work on this, because I know certainly that I am, with all the excavations I work on, in an effort to determine if this is really a distinction we can make for all animal cults, or is it really only true for the apis and the bucus and the manavis? Is it only bull cults where you have this? or do the others as well? Because some of the texts would suggest that the others had the sacred animal, um, as we can see from the, the recent translations that have been done by um, Harry Smith and all. But it is something that, you know, we, we are always, Egypt, people think that Egyptology is static, but you know, probably because you come here a lot, that it's not, and we are constantly revising Egyptian history and Egyptian culture and our knowledge. And so things that have been held true for 200 years almost can in fact be completely changed by new research. So. Okay. And um, if you look at the way the bandages are made, the decoration they made on the mummy, is it possible to see if they are um, linked to the animal or to the region where it's made or to the period? Or it's impossible to say? Now that we're getting, once we do more carbon-14, that will help. And now that we're doing more excavations that are controlled, mm -hmm. we can perhaps come up, because this is one of the big questions. Mm -hmm. um, bandage style is not regional specific, mm -hmm. unless you look at it really, really closely. And then you might even be able to do some person's hand. Because some of the stuff that we have here from Schiaparelli in Asyut, that same style I have from Saqqara. Mm. Um, so there are tiny variations, but not enough, because I haven't looked at it carefully enough, to see if it's sort of the inset goes this much or this much, and that mm. could just be the hand of the embalmer. I think maybe we could get it as being diachronic change, if not regional. Certain styles are chic at certain mm. time periods. But maybe it starts off being chic in the capital, and then it filters, so you don't know about the time lag. So these are all things to consider, and these are definitely questions we have concerning these, and this is where the C14 dating is going to help us a lot. Okay. So I mean, there's just so much that we can now, using these modern technologies, start to answer and unravel. It would be quite cool. Okay, thank you very much. Other demand? Any questions? <ride> allora, eh, va bene, se non ci sono altre domande, eh, beh, intanto sono felice di aver constatato quanto interesse abbia suscitato in tutti questa bellissima conferenza, proprio perché spesso le mummie animali lasciano un po', diciamo, sono un po' viste in secondo piano rispetto a quelle umane, però per motivi diciamo, che sono del tutto comprensibili in realtà. Sono anch'esse estremamente interessanti perché ci danno un'ulteriore visione dello spaccato della società egizia, quindi non solo eh, nel suo aspetto funerario e religioso, ma anche nell'aspetto della vita di tutti i giorni. Per questo eh, ringrazio ancora di tutto cuore la professoressa Ikram per averci dato questa, eh, questa importante veduta su questo aspetto della, della, della vita degli antichi egizi e la invito anche a tornare a farci visita più presto. We wait you as soon as possible. Ok? Thank you.